So, um, yeah, without further ado, I will welcome Ilan um, uh, to, to speak with us. Uh, it's very appropriate, Ilan, because we have NACPA Day uh, coming up next Saturday, of course, an appropriate time to, to, to think about uh, the, the NACPA, the ongoing situation uh, uh, and ethnic cleansing and um, the role of the JNF as well. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, uh, thank you for the Scottish uh, Friends of Palestine uh, for Stop the JNF. Uh, thank you all for uh, viewing this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, and, uh, as Sophia said, a week before uh, the Nakba day and against the background of the horrific things that are happening as we speak uh, in uh, Jerusalem, especially uh, uh, in Al-Aqsa. In order to understand the role of the JNF in, um, in the Nakba, we have to uh, go back a little bit before the Nakba, that is before 1948, to see how the JNF changed its mission in a way as part of the Zionist project uh, in Palestine. When the Jewish National Fund was established in 1901, the idea was that it will help to recruit money in order to purchase land in Palestine for colonization. Um, what it did uh, after the uh, initial funding went quite well, was to start and studying the land regime in Palestine in order to make sure that not only land is purchased, but also that the old land regime in Palestine would not stand in the way of a project of settler colonialism, which wanted not only to buy land, but also to evict the people who lived in that land. So they were very busy, I would say, at least until 1936, that is, from 1901 to 1936, first under Ottoman rule and then under British rule, to find a way by which they could, uh, in a way, reject the custom of the land uh, that uh, allowed transfer of ownership of land but never included or incurred the uh, eviction of the tenants who were the actual landowners. Uh, even if the owners of the land lived in Beirut and they used to, to sell it to someone else, this never affected the villages on the land because we're talking about large swaths of land there. What the JNF was very good at, uh, especially with the, big, with the help of the British Mandatory Authority, is to import into Palestine a European uh, uh, entitlement laws that would enable it not just to purchase land, but also to evict uh, uh, the farmers who lived on those lands for centuries. Once this system was uh, exposed by the Palestinian national movement, uh, people stopped selling land to uh, the Zionist movement, first in Palestine and later outside of Palestine. And that's when the JNF had to change its tactics and uh, its own understanding of how can it help uh, for the, the settler colonial project of Zionism, which is actually a, a project, as you all know, of uh, uh, displacement and replacement of uh, uh, taking the land with as few Palestinians on it as possible. So it's not surprising that if you look at the documents of the JNF from 1936 until the Nakba, you can see a change of discourse. You can see also uh, a realization, probably even before some of the Zionist leaders realized that the method of purchasing land and a victim by evicting by force the people who lived on it would not allow the Zionist project to acquire enough land to build a, a Jewish state. In fact, by the time we reach 1947, in such a method, the JNF was able to purchase for the Zionist uh, uh, community less than 6% of 
the land of Palestine. So obviously this uh, method that had some uh, successes and achievements in the 1920s in buying land and evicting Palestinians who lived on it uh, stopped being effective and definitely did not deliver uh, an amount of land that seemed uh, uh, enough or appropriate for creating a state uh, in the future. So the leaders of or the, the people who were running the Jewish National Fund in around 1936 become a lobby that is pressuring the Zionist leadership under David Ben-Gurion to adopt the idea of uh, a transfer, as they call it, a forced transfer, what today we will call uh, ethnic cleansing. And in fact, they, uh, uh, under the auspices of the Jewish National Fund in 1937, a special committee uh, of experts is being uh, convened was convened, uh, run by the Jewish National Fund to um, prepare a strategy for transferring Palestinians outside of Palestine by all possible uh, means. Because of the outbreak of the Second World War, uh, the clashes between the uh, Zionist uh, 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 gangs and the British uh, mandate uh, during the Second World War and after the Second World War, the attention to the idea of transfer or ethnic cleansing was marginalized for a while. And, and, and the JNF did not play an important role uh, in Zionist strategy up to the moment that Britain decided to leave Palestine, which happened on the 1st of February, 1947. From that moment onwards, ideas that were on paper in 1936, now I could call them ideas of wishful thinking, of uh, hypothetical uh, scenarios that might be implemented if the circumstances would be right, were transformed into actual strategy with the very same personalities who prepared uh, uh, the, uh, uh, these ideas back in the 1930s when, when it was clear that the Zionist movement will not be able by, I wouldn't even call it legal means to purchase land because what they did was illegal as well, but by building the state through purchase of land and not through uh, occupation, colonization and uh, uh, expulsion. So they their ideas become a, a strategy. I should say that even before 1947, they already did something very important, which uh, helped them to appear as very systematic and knowledgeable in the eyes of the Zionist leadership when they came with the idea of massive ethnically cleansing the Palestinians on the day that Britain decided to leave uh, Palestine. And I refer to this particular project of theirs between 1936 to 1947 in my book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, and I called it the village files. Uh, the JNF was busy pre with, prepare, together with the uh, intelligence service of the Haganah, the main paramilitary uh, 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 outfit of the Jewish community in preparing a file for every Palestinian village, all the 1,000 Palestinian villages, each one of them had a file with very detailed information uh, that uh, uh, aimed at, uh, had two aims in mind. One is to assess the richness, if one could call it, or the, the value of the land, uh, uh, its quality, uh, and uh, uh, the village uh, kind of productivity in order to create a kind of a hierarchy of deciding which villages are particularly important to take over when the circumstances would allow it uh, uh, and which villages could be left uh, for later on. So that was one aim. The second aim was to know about the uh, social life in the village with the hope of creating uh, some sort of a network of collaboration uh, uh, in the villages that would ease 
uh, their uh, future occupation and expulsion uh, during uh, uh, the Nakba. So with all this kind of systematic knowledge and this kind of a lob kind of a lobby impulse, if you want, uh, uh, the JNF played a very important role. Of course, they did not, they, they were not the final decision makers, but they were, pro they provided uh, a, a sense that it's doable, that there's already a systematic preparation for it, which I think made it easier for the leader of the Jewish community, David Ben-Gurion and his close advisors to decide roughly around February 1947 uh, to think more systematically about the massive ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians once uh, the British uh, uh, would leave Palestine. In fact, a year later, in February 1948, the JNF uh, leaders successfully pressured the leadership of the Zionist movement not to wait for the uh, final withdrawal of the British, which happened on the 15th of May 1948, which we commemorate as the, as the Nakba Day. But already in February 1948, that is, uh, a year after they started seriously thinking of how to implement the ethnic cleansing, a year later, the decision fell that you don't need to wait for the British in order to take over both the urban space and the uh, uh, countryside, um, uh, at least part of it, and uh, Judaize it, colonize it by uh, occupying the places and evicting uh, the Palestinians uh, from their homes, villages, uh, and, and neighborhoods. And, and they played a very active role. And as you probably know from the work of, of new historians in Israel and Palestinian historians, uh, the documentation for this is very rich uh, and very convincing. Uh, and, and I think this is not anymore under any, any debate uh, that this was the planning and this was uh, uh, the impulse, the main uh, impulse. The JNF played another important role. The, the, one of the problems uh, uh, is that at least what one can call the left Zionist wing of the Zionist leadership had, uh, and the JNF played a, a, an important role in solving the so-called problem for the left Zionist uh, wing. Their problem was that uh, in some Palestinian villages, some Palestinian villages were, were mixed. There were uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, residents living in some of these Palestinian villages. And um, some of the uh, kibbutzim, the kibbutz uh, 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 settlements uh, of the left wing uh, uh, Zionist parties had very good and close relationship with Palestinian villages. In fact, they had a, a kind of agreements, uh, uh, peaceful agreements, that whatever would happen after the British would leave, uh, there will be non there will be no aggression on either side towards the uh, the neighbors. Kind of a non-aggression pact, uh, I think, would be the right uh, way of, of following it. The JNF uh, sent uh, its own people to convince. Uh, the Jews who lived in Palestinian villages and the Jewish uh, settlements who had these arrangements uh, with villages to violate these arrangements and to play a very important role in the eviction of the villages where, which already hosted uh, 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 Jews uh, since the beginning of the mandate uh, as part of, uh, of you know, hospitality and, and the way of coexistence that was quite typical uh, to Palestine uh, before uh, the Nakba. Uh, the JNF uh, made sure that these people would not only stop being an hindrance for the massive ethnic cleansing, but that they actually would take a more active part uh, uh, in it. The next stage that I think is important to consider when we think about uh, the JNF and its role in the Nakba is the role it played immediately after a village was occupied and its 
uh, people were expelled or after a neighborhood in a city or a, or a town was occupied and its people were expelled. Again, I just want to make clear the JNF did not take the decision to expel. This was a decision taken by the, leadership, the political and military leadership of the Zionist uh, community. The JNF was part of that leadership and therefore uh, bears a responsibility for the ethnic cleansing by being part of that leadership. But it has a particular role uh, uh, to account for, uh, as I mentioned, uh, until now. The second kind of phase in the JNF role is what it was its involvement in the um, uh, arrangements, so to speak, of how to run a village few moments, a few days after it was occupied and its people were expelled. In some cases, as you know, quite a few cases, uh, these expulsions were accompanied by massacres. Uh, and um, uh, 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 the role of the army ended there. And the, the empty village and its deserted lands were uh, entrusted in the hands of the Jewish National Party. The first thing that they would do, and this is already in June, July, 1948, when out of the 531 villages that Israel destroyed, already about 400 villages were already done. Uh, and most of the urban space was already taken by the uh, Israeli uh, forces. So already in June, July, they organized uh, uh, bulldozers and tractors to flatten the uh, houses of many uh, villages uh, so as to uh, prevent the repatriation, the return of the refugees. The reason that they felt the urgency to do it uh, when in a way uh, their uh, conf military confrontation with the uh, military unit units that came from the Arab world had not ended yet. The war, this, this part of the war, ended only in uh, uh, the beginning of 1949. The reason that they were uh, 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 decided to um, devote so much attention to uh, erasure, to the erasing uh, uh, the villages already while the fighting with the Egyptians and the Syrians uh, and the Arab Liberation Army was still going on was that Already the international community, first through the services of the mediator, uh, Count Folk Bernadotte, and later through other agencies of the United Nations, and even emissaries coming from the United States, be, uh, uh, sent a very clear message to Israel that whatever the reason was for people leaving their villages or towns, uh, in a way the world expects Israel to allow these people to, to return once the fighting has uh, subsided. Uh, and, and the thinking that, and this is a pure JNF thinking, uh, was that if I destroy your home and I uh, take over your land, uh, it doesn't matter what the international law would say or what the international pressure on us would be, you won't be able to come back because there's nothing to come back to. Uh, and uh, this was not enough. Uh, there was another uh, project that the JNF almost volunteered to, to take over, uh, and uh, two, two other projects actually, which are important to, to mention in this context. Um, I think I'll, I'll mention even three of them now that I'm thinking about it. Three projects which are important. Uh, so, so first of all, the flattening of houses, taking over uh, the land with the hope that this prevents uh, return of people because you don't know how the international community would react if it would have the power to pressure the new state to allow repatriation, whether Israel would have the power to prevent people from returning. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, it was important to wipe out the villages and the neighborhoods. The next step, well, the first out of three steps, was to make sure that these villages are defined as ancient 
Hebrew villages, biblical villages, Jewish villages of the past. A, 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 a method that Israel would use also in justifying Jewish settlements in the West Bank uh, after 1967. Here, the JNF recruited a group of Israeli archaeologists who uh, did not do any archaeology, but used their alleged archaeological expertise to uh, confirm for the JNF that Safuria is an old and ancient Jewish village by the name of Kippori, uh, and so on and so forth for, for hundreds of Palestinian villages, and therefore flattening the village uh, and taking over the land was actually an act of redemption, uh, returning. This was the real repatriation. The Jews were coming back to villages which they lost during the time of the Romans uh, 2000 years before 1948. The second project was uh, recruiting names of, you know, recruiting pundits, literati, men of culture and poets and writers to help and give Hebrew names to uh, uh, the Jewish, to the so-called Jewish villages as was confirmed by the archaeologists. So the JNF was, was this huge kind of operation that was not busy anymore in just buying land or even advocating the expulsion of the Palestinians. It was now the main mechanism, it was also the main mechanism of how to erase the Palestinian identity of Palestine by wiping out the place, by claiming that it used to be an ancient Jewish state. And the next step was uh, uh, creating a naming committee that would give it uh, uh, a Hebrew name. The next two projects that they were involved with was in places where it seemed that it would be difficult to uh, build a Jewish settlement over the ruins of a Palestinian villages. Uh, they decided to plant European forests on the ruins of the Palestinian villages. They imported 10,000 European pine trees. And, and, the, and the purpose was twofold. One was to cover up, to cover the ruins of the village so that it would be erased from memory, from collective memory and from the a sight and conscious of, 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 of people. The second reason was uh, uh, Ben Gurion's obsession with trying to change the, the landscape. He didn't like what he called the Arab landscape, both the urban landscape and the natural landscape. Look to him, so-called, as he called it, Arab. And he wanted to Europeanize, Europeanize it. And therefore, uh, uh, some of the most beautiful part of the Palestinian natural habitat were destroyed in such a way uh, in order to, it was substituted with European uh, foresting uh, that was alien to, to, to the land. In fact, most of these forests did not survive, but they were enough to destroy uh, some beautiful parts. Uh, just uh, two days ago, in, I'm, I'm doing a project on the Nakba with some Palestinian friends and we drove through the uh, beautiful ruined village of Sohmata. Uh, Sohmata was known, apart from many other things, it, it, it had, uh, uh, next to it, it had a forest of very rare cider uh, uh, trees. The, the Galilee cider is a bit different from the uh, Lebanese cider, beautiful cider trees. They look too Arab to the JNF, so they ruined these cider uh, 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 forests and planted ugly pine trees uh, a forest. I say ugly not because the pine tree is ugly, because they are alien to that beautiful scenery there. Uh, uh, but that's the kind of thing that they did. They also covered the whole mountains of Jerusalem uh, with these uh, 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 pine trees. So the forestation project was one uh, uh, of the uh, second of the three uh, uh, projects I was talking about, or, or the four, I don't remember the numbers, because you had the wiping of the village, the archaeology uh, confirmation that it was a Jewish place, 
the naming committee that gave it the Jewish name uh, and uh, deforestation was the next step. The last step, uh, and this took a while, this didn't happen in 1948, it, it took a while and it was completed in 1953, was to settle Jews uh, uh, in the, either in the houses if they were left of Palestinian villages, but because of most cases, the JNF destroyed the houses, building new homes from there for them on the ruins of the Palestinian uh, uh, villages. The few exceptions that we have of villages that remain intact, but to which Jews moved into, the few exceptions have to do with uh, villages that look to the Bohemian uh, artists of Tel Aviv, particularly beautiful, like in Haud, uh, and, uh, and therefore they, or, or Lifta, and they insisted that they should remain intact, but of course, without the people living in them. Uh, parts of old Jaffa were uh, uh, rescued in such a way because the Bohemians or the artists or whatever you want to call the, this kind of milieu in Tel Aviv uh, uh, pressured the, uh, the government not to destroy these, uh, these beautiful houses because they wanted to live in them. Uh, and therefore they was, the houses were spared, but the people were uh, expelled. Uh, my hometown Haifa was not that lucky in terms of houses, of course, every, nobody was lucky in terms of, of people. Uh, 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 and the JNF had um, a, a kind of a sister company that dealt with the urban space. And, and that company was responsible uh, for two things. One is to destroy uh, massively uh, Arab houses in order to change the character of places such as Jaffa, Acre, Haifa, and make sure that they don't look Arab anymore. Uh, and the only way of doing it was to demolish systematically a large number of Palestinian houses. In Haifa, they also demolished one of the most beautiful covert markets in the Eastern Mediterranean in, in, in the process. And that company, Hinuma, that was, that was responsible for that. The second uh, purpose that they had it was very clear that under the new reality that was created when the, the fighting was over, when the massive expulsions were over, talking about 1950, 1951, that there were still a number, sizable number of Palestinians inside the state of Israel, what we call, what the Israelis would call later the Arab minority in Israel. And, and, and uh, the question was, will these people be able to resettle in Haifa? in Alid, in Ramle, in, in Jaffa, in Anaka. And, uh, and the role of this sister company was to make sure that any houses, which were Palestinian houses, that were now in the hands of the, of the JNF, and according to a complicated mechanism to which I would not go into, were moved, were sort of transferred from the army to the state, and from the state to the JNF, and from the JNF to private people, individuals who wanted to buy them, or uh, institutions, or governments, or the army. It was a whole kind of cycle of, of legal uh, way of organizing the pillage of these houses, or the, or the land on which these houses uh, used to be on. The purpose of this sister company was to make sure that these houses would never, never be sold to non-Jews, which is part of the uh, 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 charter of the JNF anyway, is to keep the land, the houses, anything which is under the possession of the JNF has to be kept for the Jewish people, not the Jewish people in, in Palestine, for the Jewish people around the world, and only be in, sold to Jews, and uh, it's forbidden to uh, rent, lease, or sell them uh, 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 to, to non-Jews. So uh, this uh, kind of secured uh, uh, legally, although it could have been done forcefully anyway, uh, that um, the Judaization of large parts of Jaffa, especially Jaffa and Haifa worried them, because these were the two big cities, uh, that the Judaization of Haifa and Jaffa would go on unhindered, uh, and if there would be a Palestinian minority in those two places, they would be confined to 
special neighborhoods uh, that the Israelis themselves called the ghettos uh, in 1950, uh, uh, and not to the rest of the town. So in, in Jaffa, all the people who remained in Jaffa were, Jaffa were moved forcefully to a neighbor, neighborhood called Ajami, and all the uh, people in Haifa were forcefully moved into a neighborhood called Wali, Wadi Nisnas. Um, and and, and uh, the JNF was an important, uh, through its uh, uh, agency in the cities, was an important uh, 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 tool to make sure that this uh, internal ethnic cleansing, if you want, within the massive ethnic cleansing uh, would uh, uh, continue. Let me conclude, because I promised to talk to 30, for 35 to 40 minutes. The JNF is not responsible for the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. The culprits are the Zionist leaders, ideologues, and strategies who decided already the very beginning of the Zionist project that the only way of creating a Jewish state in Palestine was by uh, replacing the Palestinians, displacing them, ethnically cleansing. However, many of these uh, leaders were also members of the directorship or, uh, or uh, the management of the JNF. So the JNF is part of it, as was the Israeli uh, army, or before that, the Israeli military units uh, uh, and all the other representative bodies that were running uh, the Zionist uh, community and later the State of Israel. However, the JNF interests us, and I don't have to tell you this because that's why we are having this webinar, is because it's one of its particular barbaric act of planting forests, resort parks, picnic areas on the ruins of Palestinian village was successfully sold to the Jewish public in Israel, to the Jewish public around the world, to the non-Jewish audiences around the world as an act of ecology, as part of keeping the green lungs of Israel as an ecological uh, act of preservation and uh, uh, of uh, uh, a project that has to do with maintaining the natural beauty and the ecology of historical Palestine. And that's why a lot of people, uh, uh, Jews and non-Jews, were gladly giving their names uh, as donators, as donors, uh, to the village, uh, to the forest that were planted on the ruins of Palestinian villages. A very good campaign succeeded in convincing at least some of them uh, to regret and to apologize to the Palestinian survivors for being part of that act of, uh, of erasure. But I think that's why we want to study and examine so closely the role of the JNF if the army might have been, and with this I would end, the army had the troops on the ground that went into a village, kicked the people out, massacred them, expelled them. The JNF made sure that the military action would be transformed into a successful act of colonization, dispossession, and Judaization that the world accepted and therefore could be used again in the Galilee in the 1960s and the 1970s, can be used again in the greater Jerusalem area today, in the south of Mount Hebron, in the Jordan Valley, in the Nakab. The ongoing Nakba or Nakba al Mustamira is possible partly because part of the Israeli actions are still described and conveyed as an act of ecological preservation uh, by a, 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 an organization, an outfit, which actually is one of the last active colonialist agencies still uh, around in our world on the, in the 21st century. So I will stop here and will gladly take your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Ilan. Um... That, that was really very useful um, and we have quite a number of questions uh, coming in. Um, 
I, I'm going to try and get through um, uh, as many as I can. Um, but there's a couple of questions just relating to the status, and, and you did clarify there at the end there, the status of the JNF KKL in the Zionist movement. So, um, uh, you know, and in your book as well, you say that the JNF was established in 1901, and uh, it was a key tool uh, for Zionist colonization. Um, uh, and one of the questions that we had, which I think you, you answered at the end, is about um, the role of Joseph uh, Weitz, you know, because he was yeah. JNF, but also part of the, lead, the Zionist movement uh, leadership. That's um, right. So the, in terms of the decisions being made there, and also one of the other questions about the role, if any, that the JNF played prior to the Nakba, so the development of the plan, uh, plan Dalit, for, for example. So could you say a little bit about that? So the, the status of the JNF KKL, I mean, obviously there's, there are different strands to the Zionist movement, there are different institutions or institutions, you know, pre-state Israel, um, but what specifically was the role in 1901 uh, from uh, as, as a Zionist, uh, as a, the, from the European, you know, decision um, until today? And do you think their status and role has uh, changed in any way? Obviously, the, the things that they, they do in response to uh, the facts on the ground, if you like, has, mm -hmm. has developed, they've adapted, but ha it's essentially, has it changed? Well, of course, something that started in 1901 is not the same uh, in sure. 2021. Uh, this is more than 120 years now in existence. But basically, uh, the best way of understanding how, how it still maintains its same role within the colonization of Palestine is to understand that Zionism is a settler colonial movement, not a colonialist movement, but a settler colonial movement. And settler colonial movements, uh, uh, as the late Patrick Wood used to say, uh, or settler colonialism rather than settler colonial movement, settler colonialism is a structure. It's not an event. It doesn't happen one day. The Nakba is not a discrete event that never happened before and is not going to happen uh, again. The Nakba is a structural event that started long before 1948 and unfortunately continues until today. So the JNF plays the same role from 1901 until today. What changes are the circumstances, its capacity, its capability, but its main role is to recruit money for taking over land, where possible by buying the land, as they uh, do in helping uh, Jews to buy land uh, in the West Bank in the 1970s uh, or in the Galilee or using their power uh, at times of war or times of violence to take land by force, by making sure that any land taken is totally controlled by uh, a Jewish outfit and is only being transacted uh, with Jews. So in many ways, this, this, the, the, the DNA of the JNF has not changed. It's, it's, uh, I think we find it difficult to understand because it's difficult to understand colonialism in the 21st century. It's easier to understand it in 1901. But it, it is still a colonialist and set a colonialist project. And therefore, um, uh, the same uh, method of appearing as uh, caring about the green lungs of the place, of the ecology of the place, the same methods of getting money from the Jewish communities and non-Jewish communities in the world to, to uh, fund these actions and were necessary using force in order to take over land and making sure that this land remains Jewish, this hasn't changed. Uh, the first successful JNF act of dispossession happened in 1926. It took them 25 years. They were not able before that. But in 1926, with the help of the British mandatory authorities, in two places, uh, in Marj ibn Ammar and in Wadi Hawaris, the JNF was able to take over land and kick out the people who lived there. And just recently, they did the same in uh, the West Bank. So here you have, uh, and uh, of course the circumstances are different between 1926 and 2021, 
but the DNA is the same DNA. It's the same chip, the same group that claims to be a charity group in Britain, that wants the money and the support of the British elite, supposedly as an ecological outfit, but is an active mechanism of colonization. Okay, um, thank you. There's a question, a good question here about um, what do we know about the sharing of financial resources between or among the JNF, Zionist forces and other Zionist institutions, you know, up to and during the, the Nakba? Yeah, well, uh, uh, up to the Nakba, uh, the JNF was, was not doing too well financially because, um, uh, you know, funding, uh, uh, was not going to the JNF itself. The funding was, was used for other purposes. Uh, but once the Nakba, uh, or once 1948 rather ended, they were entrusted with real estate. Land is an asset. Land in urban spaces is even more valuable than land in the countryside. So they became a very rich uh, agency. And here, if you want, there was a, a battle for the spoils vis-a-vis -vis the government, vis-a-vis -vis the army, vis-a-vis -vis institutions. Uh, and, 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 but uh, only recently, it's, it's quite amazing, only recently some invest investigative Israeli journalists looked at all this period from 1948 until today, and it appeared that the JNF, either in individual corruption or institutional corruption, was also part of this project. I mean, apart from taking over land, making uh, taking over land, making sure that this land remains in Jewish hands, there was also a lot of affluence, or sort of dividends, rather not affluence, dividends going with it. They made a lot of profit out of it, uh, and they some of the profits were kept uh, for their own budget. So Haaretz, the, the Israeli newspaper, I think it was two years ago try to find out why do they have still millions and millions of dollars in their account? Uh, because basically Israel does not buy land anymore. Unfortunately, they, they, they almost took all the land they want now. Uh, the rest of the land where Palestinians live, uh, Israel wants to strangulate, the, they, they don't want the land, they want to strangulate the Palestinians in, in claims. So, so uh, Israel doesn't want to buy the Gaza Strip. It wants to do different things to the Gaza Strip, but not to buy it. Um, so the millions are there because this is the in corrupted inertia of an organization who is actually the official uh, robber or pillager in the name, first of all, of the ideological movement and then in the name of, of, of the state. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, 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 it has complex relationship uh, with, with the state. I just want to add one more sentence. During the time of Ariel Sharon as a prime minister, the beginning of this century, he began a project of privatizing the national land. And that created a bit of a problem for the JNF because if private people are coming instead of the JNF that control almost 93% of the land in Israel, but they found a way to be part of a new outfit that the Israeli Land Authority that makes sure that I would say still 93% of the land in Israel can only be sold to Jews and not given to Palestinians who are Israeli uh, citizens and using its power in areas like Greater Jerusalem and other areas in the occupied West Bank to expand uh, Jewish territory. Okay, that, that's really useful. I'm going to return back to the Israel Land Authority and uh, Sheikh Jarrah as well. They've got a couple of questions about what's okay. happening today, especially in East Jerusalem. Um, but just going back to before the Nakba, so there's a question here. Um, why did some Jews live in Palestinian village? How long had they been there uh -huh. before or after Zionist settlement? Um, so re really it's a, a, a bit of the history, if you like, in terms of, yeah. you know, who, who were there, who were in these villages, you, yeah, had, yeah. you know, different uh, Palestinian Jewish uh, communities uh, across Palestine, historic Palestine. Yes, I, I, it's very difficult, I think, for people today to understand how Palestine was before the Nakba. And in fact, the Nakba is also a catastrophe in that sense. It was a fab, it was, um, it was a fabric, it was a kind of a mosaic of, of community. Some living one next to another, some living one inside another. Uh, um, 
And in many ways, the Jewish settlers, especially those who uh, didn't do too well, and maybe were not arriving in Palestine for ideological reasons, but were really refugees running away from pogroms in, in, East, in East Europe, did not really make it everywhere. Not everyone fitted to the model of colonization through a kibbutz or a moshav and so on. And they were looking for jobs and, and, and uh, cheap housing. And Palestinians were willing to host them. So, um, uh, for example, uh, and in each case has to be studied by itself, but, but there, are, there were sort of material reasons for uh, us, uh, inviting uh, uh, Jews to live inside Palestinian village. I will give you, uh, I don't have time for all the examples, but just maybe two examples will suffice just to uh, explain the mechanism. There was a big salt factory in uh, near a village called Etli, uh, run by Palestinian uh, uh, and a Jewish uh, uh, industrialist. There were, lots of, there were more than 1,000 joint industrial projects in Palestine between Jews and Arabs. And uh, the Jews who lived, uh, who worked in that uh, uh, salt plant, uh, at first only stayed there for a few hours, but then decided to live next door to, to the workplace. And they remained, so they, they, they were part of the village. Uh, in Tantura, uh, 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 Jews used to have, Jews who were more affluent, used to have summer houses, uh, uh, you know, for, for when they wanted to go to the beach inside the, the villages. In other places, uh, they, they, they work together or they found this uh, uh, a more suitable solution for individual problems of housing or, or employment. This was not a massive phenomenon. I, I mention it because, not because it was a massive phenomenon, but because they, they were really ungrateful. They were hosted by the Palestinians, and then they played a very important role in expelling the people that welcomed them with open hands when they had nowhere else uh, to live. I think that, that, that for me was just another kind of manifestation of uh, callousness uh, that should be uh, uh, paid attention to. Okay. Um, the, the, what, what I find interesting is uh, the words, you know, the, the word acquire, you know, uh, in relation to the JNF. So the JNF was um, established to acquire the, the land and, and you uh, spoke about uh, part of that meant, you know, actually buying the land. Uh, one of the questions uh, that we've had through was why, why did farmers or landowners agree to sell, okay. to sell the land and, and how, how else did they acquire? Although I think you've, you've answered the question in relation to cooperation and post 48, of course, you know, land was transferred uh, to, to the JNF. Now you have to go to the beginning of my lecture because I, I, I talked about it, but I'll repeat it. Uh, I talked about the land regime in Palestine. Uh, I, around, the, 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 around the 1860s, the Ottomans have changed the land regime. Um, in places such as Palestine, it was possible for the first time to buy land. Until then, you could only lease land from, from the state. Uh, and the state was selling land, first of all, to people who became rich landowners, such as the Sussoks of Beirut. They bought a lot of land in, in Palestine, especially around uh, Mars ibn Amr. And uh, when we're talking about land, this is not, I think, we need to go out of our world today. A land means uh, a space which will include uh, 10 to 12 villages. Okay, that's the land you buy. You don't buy uh, a dunam you, you, or uh, an acre. You buy a, a, a land that has on it 15 villages. Now, the custom was very clear under the Ottomans. Yes, the land ownership changed uh, 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 legally, but never has a land, a change of land ownership meant that anything would happen to the uh, to the tenants, to the farmers. So uh, it's a it's a complex system of land ownership, by which the landowner has some responsibilities towards the tenants. The tenants have some responsibilities towards the landowners. But there is no transfer of people. There's no movement of people. There's no displacement of people. It's the same village in which they lived since God knows when, uh, 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 centuries. 
And here comes, uh, and, and in 1901, uh, the main strategies of the JNS say, and there's a famous letter from uh, uh, Adolf Friedman, who was Theodor Herzl's main advisor on land issues. Uh, he came to Palestine in 1901, 1902, I don't remember exactly the year, uh, and he studied the land regime in, in Palestine. And as you know, the, the, the founder and prophet of the Zionist movement, Theodor Herzl, only visited Palestine once, and even that was a very, very short visit. Um, uh, he used to, say, because he had no intention himself to go there, like many German Jews and Austrian Jews, they thought it was a solution for Eastern European Jews, not for Western Jews. And um, and this Friedman writes to um, to Herzl in a famous letter. He says, you know, there's very good fertile land in Palestine. Yes, we can buy it from landowners. They are willing to, to sell it to us because we will offer them three or four times the value of the land or even from Palestinian land, rich landowners. But they don't, ex they don't expect us to remove the people. So we will have the land, but we won't be able to colonize it. So Herzl asks him, so how can we colonize it? Namely, how can we get rid of the people? And he says, under the Ottoman law, we won't be able to do it. So they needed the British to bring this entitlement laws from Europe and, to, and, and the British police came physically in 1926. This was the litmus paper, uh, the litmus uh, uh, paper, the kind of the, the, uh, the test case study. In 1926, the British police was asked to evict by force people who refused to be evicted because the land ownership has changed. And the British said, well, according to British law, if I buy your flat, I can evict you from your flat if you refuse to be evicted. And that's how they did it. The, the point is that one of the reasons for the Arab revolt in 1936 was that uh, it, it took some time for Palestinian leaders to understand it, but finally they understood that this was a trick and there was a lot of pressure and, and people stopped by, uh, selling land to the Jews in the 1930s, as I mentioned, and the whole Palestinian movement changed its orientation from uh, sitting idle while Palestine is being colonized to try and do the first an intifada in 1936, which was crashed by brutal force by Britain. Uh, and it took them three years to crash that, that revolt. And they destroyed the Palestinian military capacity and capability, which was one of the reasons uh, for the Nakba. Yeah. Um, so fast forwarding to today, we've, we've seen um, developments in uh, Sheikh Jarrah, uh, settler violence against Palestinians again. Um, what what's the relationship with the, the the JNF with other organizations such as Elad, you know, who's involved in, in sort of East Jerusalem, um, and some of the uh, sort of dispossession that's ha happening there? Because it's all you know, they try and say this is all legal. It's all to do with you know you know rights to historic rights and all of this. So uh, I guess first of all is uh, could you give an overview to viewers as to what is happening there um, and, and what, if any, is the role of the JNF in that today? Yeah, well, uh, Sheikh Jarrah is different from, from the rest uh, of, of the places, so let's talk about Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, um, uh, there is all over uh, uh, Jerusalem, around the, the old city, in places such as Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah and so on, uh, before 48, some Jewish uh, 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 families used to live among uh, uh, neighborhoods which were predominantly uh, Palestinian. Uh, and um, uh, because of the agreement between Israel uh, and Jordan, they decided uh, to move to the western part of the city. And uh, I don't think the descendants of these families really care about these houses anymore. But ideologically, the JNF helped to create a, a, you know, skew organizations that supposedly are not connected to it, but there's, it's very clear that they're behind it, that um, are trying to convince uh, descendants 
of these families to go to the Israeli court and de demand uh, uh, redemption of these houses, uh, which of course, uh, if, if the court had a modicum of decency in it, it would have said to them, okay, you want back your houses, we have to give back the houses of West Jerusalem to the 45,000 Palestinians who were kicked from there, from these houses in 1948 and their descendants, which will be a whole, almost 60% of West Jerusalem should be, should go back to its uh, right owners in, in Jerusalem. But surprisingly, even for, for an Israeli court system, uh, they accepted these demands. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, uh, they issued um, uh, a verdict that uh, the, the families who live now in these houses should be evicted and taken over. Now, the people would take it over and already have taken over a few of the houses are not the descendants of these families. The, 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 this is the youth movement of the settler movement, uh, fanatic neo-fascist uh, Jews who are uh, settling there in order to harass the Palestinian neighbors so as to try and Judaize the whole of Sheikh Jarrah or the whole of uh, Silwan with the protection of the Israeli military, military and Israeli uh, border uh, uh, police. So this has nothing to do with a wish of people to return to their homes. This has to do with one of the many methods Israel uses in order to Judaize everything that exists in East Jerusalem, around East Jerusalem, where there are in Israeli eyes 200,000 Palestinians who are the main uh, obstacle for creating a whole Jewish Jerusalem, so uh, to speak. The Gen F plays also an important role in channeling money for settlers uh, in places, other places in the West Bank in the same, almost in the same way as it did in 1901, kind of recruiting money without clear explanation what the money is for from Jewish communities around the world and channeling, channeling that money uh, uh, to the settler movement, uh, uh, not for buying land. I mean, the settler movement doesn't buy land, Israel expropriates land, but to sustain the expropriation. It's not enough to expropriate land, you need to sustain it. Uh, and so on. So in a way, they're part of a matrix of, of power that Israel uses in, in Area C, which Israel targeted as an area that has to be Judaized. Uh, the other means are military training, military exercise, uh, allowing vigilantes of the, of the settlers to harass uh, 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 the villages uh, and, 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 and creating green lungs claiming that these are no-go areas. Now, every green land that is created in the West Bank is a JNF green land. So they are very deeply involved in the ethnic, the ongoing ethnic cleansing of area C uh, that is happening as, as we speak. Yeah, so uh, what, what is this? Because um, in recent weeks, we've been hearing about uh, the JNF now, um, you know, being given the green light and, and agreeing that they, they can go ahead and, and operate in the West Bank. Whereas, you know, what you've just said, and I, many years ago, I traveled through the West Bank and you can see the JNF, you know, logo up in the, the Jordan Valley, you know, they, they, of course they, they've been there. So uh, could, could you explain what, what is the conversation now happening uh, yeah, that we yeah. see in Haaretz about- Yeah, uh, yeah, I know, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a bit confusing. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain that. Um, Originally, uh, or officially, the JNF was not allowed to, to um, uh, operate uh, uh, in the West Bank in um, buying land to develop existing uh, settlements. This is the change. I mean, uh, if you see a sign of the JNF in the Jordan Valley, uh, it's because the Jordan Valley and other places like Gush Etzion are not con are part of the uh, Israeli consensus. So, so the JNF was allowed to work there. What is what has changed is that um, while in other parts, especially in Area C, the JNF was working through a front organization in order to pressure uh, Palestinians to sell land or to pressure the army to expropriate land, uh, mainly not so much for creating new settlements, but 
for expanding existing settlement, uh, uh, the Likud, uh, I think was in February of this year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, decided to uh, make it official. And um, which means that contribution from Jews in Britain, especially Britain, Canada, Australia, and the United States, uh, would uh, uh, and already these donations are at the hundreds of millions of, of pounds are now waiting to be channeled into the expansion and development of existing settlement and the um, main body that would overlook both the recruitment of the money and channeling the money for whatever it means to develop an existing settlement this will now officially be part of the missions of the JNF. This is the change. So the JNF, you're right, the JNF was involved from the very beginning, uh, from 1967, in expanding Jewish settlements, but never officially, and always through front organization. And the only places where it all acted more officially was in the Jordan Valley and the Gush Etion, because these were areas that there was an Israeli consensus. But now it's all over Area C, uh, and uh, uh, this is the money. By the way, does, I, I, doesn't come only from Jewish sources. The Christian fundamentalists are giving uh, financial support, uh, unprecedented financial support mm -hmm. uh, for the Jewish uh, settlement. I don't know if you know, but they're sending volunteers every year. Young Christians are coming in their hordes every year to work in the settlements and help to expand them. Uh, and also the JNF organizes uh, this, uh, uh, yeah. this aid. Okay. Um, now we're five minutes, just almost five minutes past the hour. Um, uh, I've got a couple more questions and then maybe we can uh, wind, wind up um, okay. uh, to, to quarter past, if, if that's okay. Um, yeah. the, what, one of the questions uh, sort of, looping back in a way um about the the role of the jnf post 48 so the, the question was why why does the state of israel need the jnf you know once the state was established why didn't the, the government just take care of its own business you know why did it need a, a separate agency um uh, for that um so yeah uh, uh, maybe a, a little bit uh, around that because i think that ties back to um, what you were saying about the JNF's role, you know, after 48, um, yep. you know, in, in Israel Land Authority, um, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, maybe at that. And I've got one other question to follow up from, from that. Okay, yeah. In order to understand why Israel needed the, the JNF, the, the, there are two levels of explanation. One has to do maybe a good example to uh, from a totally different aspect of life. Um, we, we can rightly ask why do dictatorships need to do uh, uh, carry out elections in which they are elected with 99.9% .9 of the vote? They are dictators. Why, why do they go every few years to, to, to uh, de be democratically uh, elected? Because they want to play this charade that they are legitimately uh, 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 ruling a country uh, for all their life. For, for 55 years. In a similar way, um, one has to understand that the historical timing of the Zionist movement as a settler colonial movement meant that it needed and still needs to play a certain charade of legality, whether it's international legality, whether it's domestic legality, for particularly the most illegal part of its uh, actions. Um, and therefore, you sometimes don't want the government directly be involved in what is apparently and blatantly a violation of human rights, of civil rights, or even the Israeli laws themselves. So you need someone else to do it. Thus, for, in, for instance, you don't want to pass in the Israeli Knesset in 1949, a, a moment of celebration, uh, the Jewish state after 2000 years of exile, the Jewish answer to the Holocaust, the, um, all the ambassadors from the Western world are there. You don't want to pass a law which says uh, our uh, Arab citizens will not be able to buy land 
not able to have jobs, uh, would be treated very much like Africans are treated according to the 1948 apartheid law. You don't do that. In fact, you publish the famous Israeli Declaration of Independence, which says that Israel would not allow any discrimination on any basis for all its citizens, regardless of who they are. So you give the land to the Jewish National Fund that in its charter is obliged to uh, make sure that the land always remains in the hands, and this is what it says, in the hands of the Jewish people, not the Jewish people in Palestine, in the hands of the Jewish people, so that Jews from uh, Brooklyn can buy land in the Galilee, but the Palestinian from the Galilee could not even buy back a land that belongs to him, that was expropriated from him in 1948. So this is one reason you needed in the 50s and the 60s, the JNF, because the Judaization process was illegal, even according to Israeli law, or the Israeli ethos of being the only democracy in the Middle East. So the JNF was very, a very convenient agency that was off the radar uh, uh, and doing all these um, totally illegal expropriation of lands that led to expulsion and so on, the Judaization of the Galilee and, and, and uh, uh, and the Nakab, and later on, uh, as, as they do now in, in uh, Area C. So that's one explanation why you need it. You need, you need a, it's, Israel is a racist ethnic state, but it is regarded in the West as the only democracy in the Middle East. So you need racist ethnic agencies or agents to do the job, and you don't want the government uh, to do that. The second reason is, of course, that these bodies become very rich and they employ a lot of people and they need to justify themselves and they don't want to disappear. Uh, so it's also part of the reason the JNF is still there. This part why the Jewish agency is still there, you know, which is even more an anachronism, even in Israeli terms than the JNF. So, so it is also there because of that, because it's, it has a lot of money, it has a lot of assets from which a lot of people profit individually and they don't want to uh, to sell this milking cow to anyone else. Um, but I think uh, 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 in the 50s and the 60s, the government needed, maybe I'll just give one short example, then we'll move to, to your next uh, uh, place. Probably the most civilized manifestation of a new Jewish state was the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Jewish, Jews from all over the world, uh, scholars, uh, were gathering together, building a university, showing that uh, after the Holocaust, Jews are still scholars and, and scientists and so on. It was the, the pearl, uh, or the, the jewel in the crown. Um, and there was a campus on Mount Scopus, which was bought uh, from uh, a British person who bought it from a Palestinian, never mind, but there was a campus. The campus was unavailable because of the uh, fighting with the Jordanians. So you want to build a new campus for the Hebrew University. And the JNF says to the uh, founders or the leaders of the Hebrew University, why don't you build it on uh, the ruins of the village uh, and Badr? Because, uh, uh, Sheikh Badr, sorry. Because it's a, a village which is near Jerusalem this is where we want to build the government offices anyway. You should be next to it. We will build the Supreme Court there. Um, so we, you can have the, the village uh, as the basis for your university, for your campus. Now, the government doesn't want it to give it directly. So it, the government sells, uh, uh, gives the, 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 uh, the territory to the JNF and the JNF sells it through another agency, I won't go into it, for I think one pound to the Hebrew University. So supposedly it was a legal purchase of land to build a campus. Actually it was building a campus on the ruins of, of a Palestinian village. The same was done with the University of Tel Aviv, built on the ruins of the village of Sheikh Mawanis. Yeah. So they needed this agency for completing the pillage and, and the takeover. Okay. Thanks very much, Ilan. Um, just conscious of the time now, um, I have a 
question, a big question, but before I ask that and ask you to respond um, and with your final words as well, I just uh, say to, to uh, the viewers, um, the Stop the JNF campaign exists to challenge the JNF because the JNF um, exists. They have offices uh, around the world in over 50 countries around the world. So there's, there are opportunities for us uh, to do that, but they're also uh, part of our work is to expose and document the role of the JNF in the ongoing um, ethnic cleansing, um, protesting JNF fundraisers, for example, where, you know, in Canada and Scotland, um, there, there have been successful challenges there, um, and opposing the, the JNF's charitable or tax exempt status uh, where in, in our countries. Um, and we're working with Salman Abu Sitta, with Palestinian Nakba survivors, um, you know, organizations like Zohrot uh, uh, in Israel, who are doing really important work uh, in terms of uh, remembering uh, the destroyed uh, villages and, uh, and work with uh, Palestinian survivors as well. So what we'd like is for you, because I know this is an international audience, to get in touch with us. If you go to our website, stopthegnf.org, you can um, let us know uh, you can join the mailing list, but part of that form is to let us know that you'd like to get involved. And we have a number of different uh, projects ongoing. Um, COP26 is happening in Glasgow this year. This is, uh, you know, an international gathering. We have a call uh, on our website to keep uh, the JNF out of COP26 because of their claim to be an environmental organisation through all the tree planting um to to bury palestinian uh villages uh they, they do uh, usually try to attend these events there's also a more general uh call for action um that, that we'd like you to look at as well somebody asked one of the questions asked was about um planting trees you know working with palestinians on the ground um there are many different you know plant planting trees but palestinian plant the tree uh, projects. We're involved um, with partners in Palestine and very specifically to, to link and to raise the, the history, the political issues around the role of the JNF, but also in solidarity to support Palestinian resistance on the ground who are, you know, day to day uh, planting trees as a show of resistance to, to, to hang on to, to the land that they still have. Um, so please get in touch. You see the contact details just here and on our website. And Nakba Day, finally, in, in the short term, we've got Nakba Day happening next week. Wherever you are, uh, Badil um, is, is asking if you would take, send them their photos and short videos to them just so that they can post it up on their website. There's an email address, but we'll, we'll post that up on the Facebook page as well. Um, so that's a very quick, there's a lot of exciting things happening um, and that we're working with international Palestinian Israeli um, organizations and groups as well, hopefully to, to take this further. Now, my final question, Ilan, which is a big question. Somebody asked, you know, is there hope? Um, now, for, for, for us, I mean, I'm based in Scotland, in the UK, the JNF is still a, a very important organization in the Is Israel lobby groups. You know, they're still very proudly Zionist, very proud to, to take their, their position um, in, in defending uh, the state of Israel and the, Zion, the Zionist cause. Now we've seen, uh, a, we're seeing around the world, you know, smear campaigns, um, attempts to change legislation to try and outlaw BDS and to, to really curtail the activism and discussion uh, around um, you know, academics are getting attacked um, and uh, for for pro Palestine advocacy. Um, at the same time, for me, I got involved in two thousand and one in Palestine solidarity. I think for me today, there are even more opportunities. There are more people who are involved and know about Palestine that, through social media etc there's there's a lot of information out there and through books such as the one you've authored um but yet people say well bds isn't really working we need to try something else so i guess my question to you is do you see is, is zionism 
as a movement in decline or do you think do you see it getting stronger um do you think uh, the movement for bds where it's very specific in terms of pressure has that had an impact and should we continue um with what we're doing you know whether that's pressurizing institutions here that are complicit corporations um and exposing um the our own governments and institutions and their role in what's happening in Israel Palestine. A big question I know to end today. <laughs> yeah, there yeah, will be only a, a very concise version of it. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, Israel as a state, as a Zionist state, if you want, uh, really stands on two pillars, a material pillar, uh, a very strong one, strong economy, uh, strong strategic relationship with multinational corporations, with countries such as uh, Russia and China, and of course uh, uh, the West, a uh, high tech uh, nations, um, and um, economically probably did better than many other countries during the 2008 uh, uh, crisis and even during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. The other pillar is the moral pillar. Uh, and this was really eroded significantly due to the work of uh, organizations like yours, the BDS, the dramatic, drastic shift in public opinion uh, in the civil society all around the world. Uh, and uh, we are beginning to see some of that change in the civil society reaching uh, the politics from above uh, in positions of, uh, you know, of potential leaders of political parties, some uh, writings in the mainstream media, and definitely the academia has changed dramatically in this uh, respect. So the civil society solidarity movement and the BDS movement in it uh, contributed significantly to a pressure from public opinion on the government, on the political elites, to change policies on the ground, uh, to change their policies towards uh, Israel and Palestine. However, we're not there, there yet, it's obvious. The governments have not changed the policies as yet. Uh, the mainstream media is still not changing the way it covers uh, uh, these issues. And therefore, uh, if there is a potential compression from the outside to change the reality on the ground, we don't know it yet because that pressure needs to come has happened in the uh, campaign against the part of South Africa, also from above. It's not enough to have boycott and divestment. You need sanctions, for example, to make it effective. And we don't have sanctions against it uh, as such. Um, so I think that this is one of the major uh, struggles we need to continue, we need to enhance, we need to strengthen. But I think basically looking back uh, since the uh, uh, the beginning of this century, I think it's effective, it's it's powerful, it's not enough. That's very clear. But it should continue, to my mind. I, I don't see any alternative. But one has to take into account that if you want to stop the colonization and the oppression and occupation of the Palestinians, this would not be enough. Uh, there are other uh, things that have to happen. Uh, the Palestinians themselves as an agency have an agency in this to be united, to be democratized, uh, to push forward their own struggle in a more effective way and in uh, and not a fragmented way, which of course is a big uh, ask given the way they were fragmented in 1948. We probably need uh, to see whether the Arab Spring is going to uh, re resurface because you need a change in the Arab world if you want to to make sure that things in Palestine change. Um, and maybe you need a European spring, an American spring where democrat democratically, the governments would represent what many people want. I, I think we should work more on uh, the politics of identification between uh, the communities that are oppressed, such as the uh, African-Americans, uh, uh, the, the workers, and so on. I think that there's a need for even a stronger international solidarity that connects struggles uh, in each location with the struggle in Palestine. Uh, 
like uh, if you don't know enough about the oppression that happens in your own place, I don't think you're very effective in, uh, and, and it can easily be exposed if you're just criticizing oppression in, in Palestine. I think these kinds of campaigns have to fuse together, otherwise you lose your moral validity and people will rightly ask you why Palestine? What, what about workers in, in Scotland, uh, for, for instance? Uh, what about the fact that the United Kingdom as a whole has not hardly received any refugee and so on? So I think these issues have to be uh, uh, put together as part of the solidarity movement. It should not be discrete, it should not be fragmented. It has to be international. And I think that it would be more, more effective. So yes, the, the short answer is it is effective. It should continue. Uh, it is don't expect you need a dividends uh, in the short run. There are other processes that have to take place that do not de depend on you. Uh, but you should do your part because one day maybe the other processes would mature and then your part will become even more important than it is today. Thank you, Ilan. Uh, yes, <laughs> a lot to do uh, and Absolutely. for the long haul, for sure. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Ilan, um, thank you all. for your time. You. Um, it's been very valuable. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Again, contact us, contact details here. If you have questions uh, afterwards, please email. And um, a good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.